It is the 7th of January 2023 and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. We are back with another episode and back with Jeremiah who has been missing. You we missed you. We missed you. But now we're now we're missing Adrian <laughs> for change. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the uh, the internet was not as robust where I was. <laughs> as you were in as well. We talked about this here already before. Um, you were in the Antarctic. I was uh, even on the continent itself. And, on the continent uh, itself, so you made a you you did a an expedition on a ship that does I expeditions, did. Uh, and I you did. were there for how long were you there? Uh, the whole trip was about three weeks, three weeks long. All right, maybe including getting there and getting back. Yeah, maybe a little longer. You know, um, flew to right. Santiago, Chile, uh, which is a, a city I like a lot. I, I've worked there. Um, and uh, it reminds me very much of LA in in a in the climate and vibe. It's a very very easygoing city. Then um, we spent a few days uh, there, and then uh, got on a plane and went to Ushuaia, which is in Tierra del Fuego, the very very tip, where we got on a very um, amazing um, ship. Or even super yacht, whatever size they uh, the delegate command, these things. The Commandant Charcot. The Charcot. And uh, it's, it's with a company called Ponant, which is uh, Ponant is uh, a company started by sailors. And um, it, it's very much focused on integration of, say, uh, luxury travel and science so that the Passengers are paying for the science. There's labs on board. There's a lot of science um, underway. There's rovers that go underneath the ship to explore the the bottom of the or as as deep as we can go. Um, and it's an icebreaker, so it it follows in um, it can follow in the footsteps of Charcot, who's very famous uh, uh, French. Um, Explore uh, around the turn of the century and beyond, and uh, you know he, he's not as famous as Amundsen and, and the rest of those guys, but uh, he did amazing things. He was very anti-whaling early. Um, he was uh, very much compassionate to the wildlife there. Um, had a very different view than most of the kind of economics of the ocean then. Um, so. You know, we set sail basically to follow the footsteps of Charcot and where he, um, where he, he kind of sailed and where he explored, um, though we didn't have to, you know, uh, be frozen in the ice for nine months. <laughs> we continued. <laughs> that simplifies was, things slightly. Yeah, it was a little bit easier for us and, and uh, you know, we, no animals were eaten on our ship. Um, the ship was pretty amazing in that it, you know, it had a, um, a complete uh, desalination plant, water purification, gray water recirculation, absolutely liquid hydrogen run, um, leaves absolutely no footprint there. Um, uh, so it's, it's very advanced. It was only its second voyage. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we got to know the captain. The bridge is open. So you can just walk mm -hmm. on and off the bridge, uh, and the the actual bridge itself is <laughs> it's like uh, you know Star Trek, you know uh, the, the there's no kind of twin rudders pushing it. There's six 360 degree turrets basically. They're pods, each one with a very new design propeller. Um, which could swing in all manner of ways. And in reversing the engines on one of them, it became, becomes an ice crusher. So, uh, you know, being on the bridge and watching the captain navigate, you could navigate this like a canoe, like hmm. with joysticks. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. And also spent time with the engineers who are involved in the design and, and construction of the ship uh, wow. over the course of the... Uh, 
of the voyage. Uh, so it was um, it was amazing. They're building another ship that is hydrogen powered, and that will be launched, mm -hmm. I think, in a couple of years. So that so that satisfied your your tech nerd side uh, for sure. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I, I was I was sort of uh, in in heaven because yeah. not only was I able to satisfy the kind of overall of living in a highly yeah. uh, evolved technical piece of equipment, uh, but I of course brought my own technical pieces of equipment that, that was that that was where i was trying to lead on to because that, <laughs> yes, that was we'll the, the techie side and how how about the photography side well the photography side was very very um you know exciting because um <laughs> honestly i've been at quote out of practice uh having been immersed in um the ai world as anybody listening to this podcast let me let me know. bring up some of your photos that you uploaded for us by the way those are tfop photos uh tfttf.com slash tfop photos um i will link that in the show notes so um so so those photos are real right the uh, ones yeah. that you uploaded. <laughs> yeah, uh, the ones Most that I... Them, oh, right? not all of them. Ah, not ah, all ah. of them. And uh, we'll, we'll go through them. But m most of them are. And, and most of them, uh, I hazard to say, I just got back um, from the lab uh, my negatives, which I just kind of uploaded into Lightroom. And um, I'm about to um, engage in my editing process uh, this is these are unedited um, straight from camera straight from camera and they're they're just stunning the the tonalities I I thought um, and so these are very easy and quick to upload um, to our so let's let's get website. let's get techy just just to make sure um, that we Susan. are on the same pie on, on the same page <laughs> where where uh, what 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 did you shoot with um, I shot with uh, well, I, I brought a uh, small Canon uh, camera that was made for Japan. It, it's really like a, a monocular that, that can capture. All right. Uh, I, I use that infrequently because I, I don't really consider um, my wildlife photography as anything uh, terrific. You know what I mean? They're, they're oh, people. same with me. It's, uh, yeah. And, and, and they, you know, they tend to look like everyone else's, you know, it's like, it's a penguin. It's great. It's a cute <laughs> penguin. But, but, you know, if you're not using an 800 millimeter, you know, Canon lens on a tripod. You kind of need that, yeah. You know, so, so that isn't really, I, 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 I feel very much, you know, a landscape photographer, um, in, you know, in my heart. I love that. Um, so I did. I did bring that uh, again, more for optics than for anything else. I brought my Leica Q2, um, which I used um, maybe twenty-five percent of the time, maybe thirty percent of the time. Um, that shot uh, is probably done with an iPhone, um, and and yeah, shockingly. Of course, yeah. Shockingly, uh, the iPhone images on the 14 were so good. Shockingly good, yes. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the skin, this is, um, this is probably a like a shot. But, By but the way, um, we were talking about images, so this is a video episode for sure. Right. Everyone who's listening, we're, we're looking at some images here. Um, but but the, a combination of, of uh, the Leica, which I could hold near and dear uh, strapped to me the scary thing about using an iphone uh, is like first of all now this one uh, we'll get to this well we'll, we'll get to these yeah yeah um the scary thing about using an iphone is of course it's the antarctic you're not barehanded and it's clumsy and the ergonomics are not you know great. there's 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 a there's a there's a little helper which is um yeah i know uh, uh, well first of all a strap that you can put around your wrist so and <coughs> then attached to a case around the iphone there's a little a little <clears throat> oh I, I i happen to have one here there's a little swimmer little uh, uh, yeah. life raft for your for your phone um, and of course modern gloves tend to have tips that you can up operate the phone with yeah but, I had glove, uh, but, but I had still, glove inserts clumsy, that yeah. did that it is clumsy and you don't want to lose your phone there because you'll never get it back no 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 uh, and and so there's that 
Uh, and I brought a, a, a Fuji uh, 6x9 with uh, 10 rolls of 120 film. So I, right. I shot as large a negative as I could um, without carrying around a 4x5. Highly impractical without a expedition team to help you out. So... Well, um, you don't have to do glass plates. I, I did I did a digit I digitized 180 glass plates over the holidays. So we'll talk about this in, yeah, a, in another sure. episode. But that was quite a project, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so between the the uh, six by nine, uh, which was very exciting, um, you know, and you don't really need a, a light meter. <laughs> and and six by nine is very close to large format. I mean, it's half. It's not, half not, of a four by five. About. Yeah, so so it's it's bigger than anything else that you can easily carry around. Yes, I'm very happy with the negatives I got back yesterday. Yeah. So um, that was fun. so. It, it was a real um, mixture of formats, a mixture of techniques, um, of gratification. Um, and uh, as I go through them, it'll be interesting to see what kind of plays. Um, funny, which uh, I, f my instinct is that the Leica was the least satisfying, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's my absolute favorite camera. Um, satisfying I, in which respect? I, I'll, I'll explain one of the problems that, um, that I encountered that was very surprising is especially when you're on the continent, which is, I mean, it's very bright, shall we say. Yeah. It's very, very bright. Uh, it's hard sunlight. And you are, I mean, you really have to wear very, very intense either goggles or, or uh, sunglasses. Um, just... <laughs> uh, well, well, just so, to not go blind over time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so um, getting your eye to the eyepiece was challenging to say the least number well at, at least it seems to have have had an eyepiece because if you are just using the display on the camera that no there's no way to you can't see because no, it's you, super you have, glare you have dark glasses and uh, the sun is and that that thing is trying to compete against very very bright light and unless your your uh, eyepiece is directly against your eye um, it's very, very the the flares and and the ex the exterior light mm -hmm. is very, very difficult. Um, so that was very challenging. Um, if if it clouded over, then I I was able to kind of drop my glasses, get my eye up to the viewfinder, which was much more satisfying. Um, with the um, iPhone, oddly. It's a very bright screen, and even in hard sunlight, I could compose uh, pretty mm -hmm. effectively. And, and uh, oddly, that was um, something that I, I kind of felt surprised with, the, the differences in working in kind of harsh light, a lot of glare with glasses, sunglasses in particular, um, and goggles so if you needed them. being on a ship... Most of the time, you, I, I guess you did expeditions on land, but um, being near the ship all the time d means that you didn't have any bigger issues with, with the cold because you always had fresh batteries and stuff. Yeah, well, it's not a problem. Um, also, the, the camera, no, the, the, I never had any battery problems with anything. You were also quite lucky with the weather, I, I heard. Um, we were very lucky with the weather. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we weren't that close to the ship. I mean, you know, we, we, would, uh, we would, you know, kind of be on or near a glacier on very, very dense ice, often up to 30 feet, um, right. sometimes four feet, sometimes, you know, but enough, they, they would take core samples, they'd drill it, they'd, you know, use radar light up to, to make sure that the ice was uh, reasonably stable. Uh, the team would go and mark the safe zones so you didn't fall through any cracks. And then off we went and we were told, you know, see you back in a few hours. We, we spent um, most of the days uh, off the ship, whether it's in Zodiacs, landing on islands or, or hiking. It was Good. not like... Uh, Cruising, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. obviously, crossing the Drake's Passage, which we'll talk about. You're on open sea, and as you navigate around channels, you spend time navigating. But the, 
the point of the this particular um, sailing is to get as close and as um, uh, not only as close to the land, but explore areas that that are very um, unexplored, landing on places that there's no record of, of a ship going. And of course, the penguins, which have no predators on land, they're all like, whoa, look at these guys. Who are they? Hello, people of Earth, and welcome. And, and, they, and we have to be very, very careful not to get more than five feet away because you don't want to give them any human diseases. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's what, I think that's, that's one of the important things. Going down there means that uh, you cannot bring anything, you cannot take anything. So when, uh, you, when, you, when you go down there, you are you're going to disinfect the stuff you bring with you. And Every time. Uh, yeah. You come on and off the ship. Everything is is uh, vacuumed, disinfected. It's yeah. a very technical process because yeah. not even a seed should go onto the yeah. uh, Antarctic Peninsula, and, and and that's what worries me about a lot of tourism and these kinds of ships that are yes. not as uh, eco friendly as the one we're on. So so let me ask you a question because um, I have taken very great care to make my different cameras as similar as possible in operation because I want to minimize the cognitive load in, in a situation like that. <laughs> the switching between different kinds of gear and different brands and different uh, modes of operation. And I found that making them as similar as possible and this is this is two Canon cameras, so it was quite easy to do. Uh, helped me, especially when being in a in a situation like that, where I know that I will probably not get there again. Um, I I see myself often switch into this uh, hunting hunter's mode, you know, and then the 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 great care and the great thinking about this and that picture, kind of goes in the background and makes way for a bit of a more of oh, oh I got oh got it I got it I got it I got it and then you end up shooting more than you would typically just because you have the feeling that that's probably a once in a lifetime chance yeah I didn't really um I, I, I luckily I don't suffer from that uh, particular affliction <laughs> so um but but I would depending on what the day was like so for example if we were um going to be running through, you know, hundreds of icebergs at reasonably close range uh, safely uh, on the water, I, I, I wouldn't take my six by nine. It was too impractical. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's the and, kind of situation I mean, because you end up seeing things that you haven't been that close to before and you and you come around a corner and you see something that's that's even more amazing and yeah, then something exactly. that's even more amazing. So so it's more like, oh, I gotta capture this because this might be the most amazing thing that I've ever seen. And then you Yeah, and uh, yeah. so uh, you know, if I knew what the conditions were, like if I needed to be very, very physical, yeah. hands-on, whatnot, then generally I would take very light gear. Um that I would uh, just like my the Canon was very interesting in that uh, it could just slip in my pocket. It was very yeah. very small. It was very point and shooty, um, and I would sometimes use it just to stack up some images, but but infrequently. Uh, the iPhone was always with me, so that always was a go to. Uh, but if I if I had if I needed say one hand, the Leica would do. If I needed mm -hmm. two hands then the iPhone would do if I because I could slip that into my pocket. If I if I was on on land on a high you know on a hike on a walk, then I could take the six by nine and compose and you know get my eye close and, and be more right. formal. So I judged it basically on what the particular expedition would be that day or or that afternoon or that morning. Uh, and that's kind of how I did it. And of course, once on the ship itself, because we were navigating some extraordinary, uh, just incredible passages, um, that I was able to use the the six by nine just right at the you know at the top of the hull. There weren't 
that many people so I could get a really stable composition. The ship was moving maybe five or six knots, so it was, and the seas were calm. So in that way, I was able to do some formal work. Um, I did bring a tripod, but it was silly because the, the light is so bright. <laughs> I was rarely shooting under five hundred or or two fiftieth. Uh, and know, a, sh and the ship is and the ship even that size is a moving platform, so the tripod will help you keep the ship in focus. Uh, yeah, it was a silly yeah. thing to bring, and uh, you never know. You yeah, never know. I didn't, uh, but my next trip there. <laughs> well, you know, you know the the. Um, the Antarctic has its aurora, and shooting that at night. Did you get any? No nights. Phenomena. We were, we were at the height. Oh of the well. Summer. Oh oh. Have, yeah. Sorry. So of course you didn't have any <laughs> nights. Yeah, we didn't have any darkness at all. Yeah, when we were there. Uh, which is. Uh, Did you have good curtains? <laughs> we had very good curtains, and sometimes you know you'd wake up at two in the morning and go like, God, I wonder where we are. You know, <laughs> be blinded. Oh, by yeah. the light. So. I've ex I've experienced that in uh, Norway up in the Lofoten, yeah. and it it's it's very dis. Uh, it, it, it's very confusing to not really get the the feeling that oh I should go to bed and then you look and it's like oh it's 3 a.m. what happened and yeah, it's, yeah but you get you know you get into a rhythm because you know you want to be you have to <laughs> you have to because you know you want to be um, ready to kind of uh, disembark whenever it's um, it's right I mean they would you know they would go all along passages then they would bring up a small helicopter, they'd, they'd scout the particular areas for navigation or, or groups of penguins, seals, whales, and uh, depending on the weather and where it was, uh, where all of these things converged, the captain would go like, oh, we just spotted this really rare colony of emperor penguins and we're going to head there, we should be there in about an hour, uh, maybe two, and we would cut through the ice and then they would, you know, do the expedition, make sure it's safe, etc. Or we'd get on Zodiacs to land, which is in and of itself, some of those places that we went, very tricky landing. I mean, you know, especially if the seas start to kick up, there's yes. no docks. It, you know, it's it, it, it's a whole process of, of not getting into the water. And the, the thing, okay, so I, I don't have Antarctic experience, but I've been plenty to the Arctic. And, it should be um, similar. The, the th well, in some ways, yes, but the, the one thing that on my first uh, on my first expedition up there, the thing that that amazed me most is that yes, there are uncharted waters. Yeah, and are. you would you would think that Earth has been measured, like every inch has been measured and and, and cataloged and documented. No, it's that's not the case. There's a lot of areas where a ship doesn't know how deep the water is, and you have yeah. to be careful, and you have to use your sonar, and you. Um, you don't have maps for everything, and things change. So, yeah, uncharted waters is a, is a real thing. Yes, it's particularly true in the southern polar regions because, in the north, of course, they were using it. You know, the the you know for for trade, and they were there's shipping routes. Get, there are shipping. routes. That's right. right, but there's there's no <laughs> quote reason to go down to the southern pole, I and mean, you can't whale, you can't fish. Right, I mean, it's highly highly, uh, which is. Uh, amazing that it's been able to maintain that level of purity. Um, they were measuring the water daily for microplastics, and as of uh, now, they, they have not found them. Well, where we were, there's yeah, and there's there's fewer um, microplastics in the Antarctic than there are in the Arctic because of currents, um, etc. Well, because yeah. of currents, also because of uh, the majority of people live in the northern <laughs> hemisphere, and sure. uh, so on. The one thing that the one thing apparently, and um, we talked about this on on Curiously Polar on the other podcast that I do. We talked about that. Uh, the, the one thing that you find everywhere apparently is um, rubber from car tires. Those hmm. little bit stuff falls yeah. off them or rubs off them, and that she, that seems to be uh, going into both hemispheres uh, quite yeah. quite actively. I think, so I think what's really happening is the warming of the waters are driving the krill yeah. further south. The penguins, which have traditional hundred you know ten thousand years of 
procreating on this island are, you know, diminishing their colonies because they have to move south. And, you know, the whales are moving further south. So the, the problem is that the, quote, cultural shift, this interregnum period that we are in, in terms of transit uh, in the Antarctic uh, is, is slowly but surely creating a lot of kind of um, ecological chaos. Uh, it's not highly visible, but it's coming. In other words, you're looking at a penguin of eight, 900, and you go, wow, that's a lot of penguins. But 10 years ago, there may be 2,000. So yeah. that's, that's kind of what's going on. On the other hand, because we, we, we have the um, opportunity of a very, very calm and unusually calm sea on the Drake Passage, which is known for 30-foot waves yes. and really brutal conditions as norm. Well, when we, we set out, it was more like the Drake Lake, we called it. And, and uh, as we approached the Antarctic, um, I don't know, the sea shelf, where, where you have this um, huge, uh, you know, a storm of krill. It's just masses of, of uh, where these currents come together and you have all of this food um, normally you don't see this, but because the water was calm, we were able to initially, uh, I, I remember I, I was walking early in the morning and uh, spotted a whale. off of, and, and within 15 minutes, the captain said, oh, we've just spotted a little pod of whales. Hmm. Within a half an hour, there were, we just, they stopped the boat for like two or three hours. Two over 200 whales, all fishing together, diving together, uh, blowing their bubbles to kind of, that's how they net the krill together and then feed together. And this went on and on and on, uh, hundreds of humpbacks. It, it was just uh, uh, miraculous. And the, the captain said he, he had never seen anything in 25 years that was anything like this. Hmm. Um, and then they were curious, so they followed the ship, you know. And, and we're not talking about in the distance. I mean, right there. These whales, like, just playful and joy with their babies. And it was just pretty amazing. And so uh, that is, you know, part of the, the calm sea that we're in. Because normally, uh, when you hit that area, you're just holding on for dear life. That is the norm in those seas. Um, but again, we were just fortunate. Um, very cool. So, so you said that there's uh, science on board, and mm. uh, did you did you uh, d get into closer contact with the scientists? Did you yes, yeah. document yeah. some of that? Was that part uh, of what I, you I took to a, do? yeah? I mean, the, the documentation is a little hard because they have all these kind of super microscopes and whatnot, which I was able to look, and you you, you can see all the crystallizations, and right? The, the, uh, the foodstuffs and, and uh, you know, spent a little time uh, with the chief science officer with his rover underneath the ship. And it, it's like the Amazon underneath there. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the, the life force in the Antarctic waters, sponges, starfish, you know, all manner of kind of unusual um, plant and animal life uh, is there. Um, and they're my, you know, very microbial, but, but it's, very quote verdant or whatever the ice <laughs> term is, but it was it was um, that was really incredible. So I did spend some time in the labs. Um, they take on different uh, projects uh, every voyage, with you know a, a group of scientists, um, and it's you know sometimes it's about measuring ice, measuring water, see I mean all manner of different science uh, goes on there. Um, specifically, and then they have their general um, expedition uh, research of uh, monitoring the colonies of the animals there, which are sort of a leading indicator of sure. what's happening planetarily. But it was like uh, it was the closest thing to being on another planet, I would say, because the I, sheer I would think so, yeah, the vastness of it and the sounds of it is the thing that struck me. Uh, the most, you know, I, I no photograph can capture the sound of, you know, 
hundreds of whales singing to each other. I, did you, you hear know, them? Did you hear yeah. them through the hull? You could hear them. Uh, you could just uh, you're outside on the bridge. You're just right. watching them. It's just. Yeah, we, we heard in, in around uh, Svalbard in the north, we heard uh, seals sing to each other uh, yeah. through the hull at night. So you uh, were lulled into the sleep by the siren sounds of the yeah. seals. It was, yeah. I think that that is part of the magic. Also, you know, on land, the, the kind of quacking or whatever they, <laughs> they make of the penguins which are adorably cute and awkward and they fall and they slide on their bellies and their backs and then they get to the water and they're like these rocket ships. And, you know, a few of them would jump into the Zodiacs <laughs> just for fun and then out. They, no fear at all. They just, you know, wow. playful. So, so what were your favorite subjects? Um, I, I would say... Overall, icebergs were, were the things that... The I, wild shapes and the size of these things. Just amazing, because you realize yeah. only maybe 10, 8% of it is above water. And, and um, some of that is, is city size, so... Yes. I mean, yeah. you know, a photograph doesn't give them the... I mean, you need to show the scale of it with... It's, a, it's really a, difficult, yeah. It's, it, but they are... They're the thing that I, I just couldn't... I couldn't take enough pictures of icebergs, and um, I How love the light. What, uh, generally, it's uh, the further south you get, the clearer and clearer and sharper it is. Right. Uh, on the open sea, sometimes we had softer light fog. Uh, often, sometimes uh, we would be out in the zodiacs, and the fog would roll in in five minutes, and it, that's quite. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, quite scary because you can't see anything. And if you're mm -hmm. around these icebergs and you don't want to get too close to them because they tip and they calve and, they, you know what I mean, they can they kill you. They are dangerous, easy. yes. <laughs> so um, there, there's, uh, there's that. But, but uh, I love the soft light of, of the ice. Um, that I loved. Um, the hard light is a little uh, more challenging to deal with. Um, as we, you know, as we said, just even the taking of the picture. But again, the contrast is so sharp and snappy. It's like putting on an extra sharp lens. It's uh, pretty great. Um, but, I, you know, all in all, I think uh, I was most grabbed by the icebergs um, because <laughs> it's just something you don't see every day uh, and that size and scale. All right. So we have about 20 minutes left. So is there is there anything that like what what is the the biggest thing that you took with you the most salient thing that you took with you? You mean in terms of what I took away? In, in terms or, of what you took away, what what is what is the is can you boil it down to one big thought or maybe a couple of things that that you keep thinking back to yeah. over and over? The, the earth without people is a really great place. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I mean, yeah. And I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm saying, you know, you're in a place that is majestic, awe-striking, beautiful, magical. The relationships of the animals together, the birds, the seals, the penguins, the whales, that ecosystem under the water, over the water, ice. Uh, there's no governments, there's no time zones, there's, you know, uh, there, there's just a purity of the planet that once existed everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, I fear this is one of the, the, the last fading beauties of our, of our planet currently. Uh, and unless we magically change quickly, it will be transformed. Now, You know, it will probably be transformed to the likes of, you know, one could imagine in 500 years that, that the human race will have outlived its usefulness and, and hmm. be gone. And then the planet will recover and be a different thing and, and you know, have another nine billion years before it's swallowed into the sun. Um, but, you know, uh, again, the appreciation of the purity of, uh, of the real majesty of our planet uh, without humans 
is something that you embrace. And yet the, the irony is you're a human, you're there. And just by being there, you're transforming it. So there is some hypocrisy in, in my sort of <laughs> loving attitude here. Uh, so were there any like moments that stand out? Any, any time spots he, in time there? He, here's the thing. You think every day, well, this is just it, right? This is just amazing. And then, as you said, two hours later, there's something even more amazing. And that just happened every single day. And the people on the ship were, were all sort of of a piece, very international. Um, few Americans, few Canadians, but a lot of uh, mainly French, I would say half French. Yeah. Uh, the boat was French. But, you know, Chinese, Indian, Dutch, German, I mean, just people from all over who all had the same sensibility. It wasn't, they weren't there, quote, to have a great time. They were there really to observe and, and embrace and encounter and capture and have that feeling. So there was a nice camaraderie that evolved out of the, you know, there's 109 passengers and maybe 250 crew. Uh, the crew itself put together almost individually by this captain, H.N. Garcia, who's just amazing. Um, and, and the appreciation of even the guys who do the laundry or the, you know, they weren't relegated as many boats are, you know, the, quote, Filipino crew that you never see that are, no, right. they were introduced and celebrated to the passengers. So they're like being on a film set, you know, even the people who bring you coffee, uh, they're as important as any actor, director, assistant director, cameraman, because they all are contributing to the experience. And not only that, this captain was the kind of person who, if the helicopter was doing a little scout in the morning, he may be, you know, he would go down to the guy, you know, one of the crew members who was just working on the garbage compacting and go, hey, get your ass upstairs you're going to get in the chopper and see something amazing. So this, you know, 20 year old uh, Filipino worker who's in the bowels of the ship would all of a sudden experience something great. And that tells you a lot about the sensibility of the captain. He was, uh, and is an amazing, uh, human and, and, uh, really responsible for the design and in, in so many ways of the boat and, and its, uh, process. And, um, I, look forward to doing Iceland and Greenland in a few years with that same boat. Very cool. Yeah. So how about how about we look at some of your pictures and talk about, sure. about those? Um, uh, you, you, you pick one. I'll just guide uh, me. Uh, let's do the um, the penguin. <laughs> the, I guess the, the lonely yeah. little the lonely penguin. penguin. It's, I, I, I saw this and I go, it gave me a chuckle. So that is real. You didn't uh, you this didn't is ask uh, mi you didn't ask Mid Journey to make you a penguin. Straight out of the camera, this is uh, <laughs> pretty much what I saw. The the light was very flat and gray, yeah. which I loved. Um, so it, and you see the this is on the mainland of Antarctica, so you can see where the ice is in the water. Uh, below and you see the you know I, again I, I was very and it disappears uh, into nothing pretty much yes and then you have this beautiful kind of rendering of this um, graphic of the snow and the snow you know compacted hundreds and hundreds of years of snow on snow on snow on snow that's really how it is and then under that you have sea ice which is frozen and then land and then there are rivers down there I mean it's it's a whole whole world so I like that picture. Uh, it's 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 uh, totally uh, uh, after my taste because <laughs> I, I love I love the pictures that 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 make it very clear that what the subject is, but that also make it very clear that the, there's a lot of picture there around the subject. So a lot going on here. The, the spacing, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It's 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 cool. So, so that's that's one. Um, I I maybe the one. Uh, just in the bottom center of the iceberg there. That oh, one, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, again, the, the, the majesty, this must be 10 stories high, 
if it's you know hundred feet majesty high, and the, and the, and the, and the different shapes you get in one iceberg this one has the smooth rounded shapes which which indicates that that it's been rolling in the water for a long time but then also the, you see where it's calved the off the front where it's broken off pretty yeah. much and that is rough and and yeah hmm it really um you know i I like this because uh, this is something that really you don't see uh, every day. It's, this is uh, the... Uh, and a photo doesn't do the size justice at all. That's always the problem that... It is. You yeah, want and you if I put a boat in there, it would, it, it would be a different picture. Um, yes. The, the other thing that, that struck me, um, you know, besides the sound, um, is the, the air... The ionized air, the clarity, the clean, that energy, the, the energy of just breathing this air is, mm. is palpable. And, and again, it wasn't that cold because it's summer, so it, it hovers just below freezing. Um, though, you know, if you go next to it to the left, you'll see, um, yeah, you, you'll get a sense of uh, this was a cold you know, winter you day going You can see the, the wind blow, yeah. Yeah, and, and so this really gives you the sense of Antarctica um, the way um, you'd imagine Antarctica. Uh, you know, it's the unforgiving nature of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be up there. And again, the scale of this is very, very hard to <laughs> render. These are probably 3,000 meter... 2,000, 2,500 meter cliffs. I mean, they're high. Okay, let me let me pick another one. Let me pick one. Um, of course, this one. What what's now, up with this one? There was well, a, here, was there was there a, a four master there? Yeah, well, here <laughs> no no four master. <laughs> if you nope. go back go back for a second, uh, go back to the now. You see right above it. You see this picture. Ah. Uh, yes. So that's that's a uh, this one was a. Um, Image to image, uh, mid journey adjustment. Ah, so there's your AI. <laughs> this is the this is the AI interpretation of. Uh, so it, it it started with the seed of my photo, and then I basically gave it some prompts um, right. about uh, a, a coming storm. Uh, interesting that I did not ask AI to put a ship in. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. It did it <laughs> because it thought, well, I don't well, even think I said Antarctica, which is interesting too. Yeah, but your, your prompt <laughs> probably gave it away that this is uh, sea and water related and iceberg yeah. related and yeah. storm and so on. So a ship seems like a good fit. So, I, I, you know, I thought, you know, I'll throw this in because, it, you know, God, you know, an apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I, <laughs> it's very, very difficult. An artist is an artist. Yeah. Um, and then there's awesome. another one. If you look at the, uh, if you go up up one to the very uh, right, no, same row as this the, one. Yeah, that one. So that's. Um, that's right Look off how the calm the sea was. I mean, it's it's like a mirror almost. Yeah. And this is very typical of a a day in a passage. So not on the open sea. Yeah. But uh, in these, you know, basically they're they're. You know, if you look at the map, you, you can see their inlets and whatnot. Um, some of which are hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of miles long that are just glassy. And if there's no wind, which there often was not, um, and you see the, the kind of ice blue, the puffy clouds are, it's just gorgeous. So I fed this into uh, Mid Journey as a route and then asked it to make a storm. And that's what I got. And there's a storm. This I image did prompt with Antarctica. Image to image. Image to image. All right. Um, okay, last question. I have uh, found that being at an, in an amazing place, and yes, it, bring, it takes me into that, oh my God, I, I, I have to take these pictures mode. Um, and in some of, for, with, with some of those places, I had the opportunity to go back 
and shoot again. Um, and it changed the way I approached it. It changed my photography. It changed because um, because I knew what to expect much yeah. better. And uh, um, is there anything that if if you ever get back to Antarctica, what well, is there anything you would make different? Do you would do differently? Yeah, I, I would probably um, tune my gear um, to for the understanding of the you know the the variance of of light. Right. That's that's number one. Uh, I I would um, elect to be a little more protective in terms of water. Not that I had a problem. And one of the great things about the Leica Q2 is that it is sealed, so it's it's water resistant. Can take splashes, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I would certainly bring some help for my iPhone, <laughs> to being able to yeah. hold it. Um, but but ge generally, um, I don't think that I, w I would probably lighten my load gear-wise because, as you said, the more flexible you are, um, the quicker you can respond. Knowing what kinds of things you're going to see, you can go, well, I use this camera maybe two or three times. It's not worth bringing all of that stuff, you know, especially if you're shooting film with lead bags and all, all of the encumbrances. Oh, that. yeah, that, 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 that has complication to the travels for sure, yeah. Yeah, it does, so, especially now. So, so um, you know, so, so lightening my load, making it a little more efficient, um, probably is something I would not bring a tripod, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but other than that, no, I think I made the right choices in terms of gear. Um, so we are we are um, going to see more of those. Yeah, of your, of as your, I start your, to edit. <laughs> your art. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You are you're uploading this to our uh, or some of those to our photo site. Yeah, I, so. I've only uploaded uh, this to our site. I haven't really uploaded yeah. it anywhere else. Um, I'm I'm still just uh, getting my uh, arms around the kind right. of managing of the how many uh, pictures images. did you bring did you count them no i haven't yet <laughs> guess <laughs> but it's not in the, it's not in the thousands it's probably i'm gonna guess 300 maybe oh that is very very conservative i've uh i would well okay so well, i learned by the way 10 10 rolls of six by nine is just you you know, there you get eight shots per roll. That's eighty and, shots, yeah, that's not a lot. And and generally, I I would on the, on that I would just elect to go with one or two images, and I would just sure. adjust those. So, so there's that. The iPhone I probably shot more than anything, just because it's like click 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 click. Uh, and the Leica um, was a little more studied. So I mean, it, I don't know, but I'll let you know uh, next week how many I actually All right. did because I'll have another. All right. I think if you, if you didn't bring a pick, I brought like I an did. emergency pick. Did you bring one? I have a pick. I haven't put it in because I, I wasn't sure where to put it. I've created an entry for us. Okay, in our hold on. I will documentation. Put it in. Let me. Okay, so I have I have one pick that okay. um, is kind of an emergency pick, but then on the other hand, I uh, still think um, it's worth it. And this it's this photo. Let me open that up. Uh, that I just recently came across on Twitter. It's uh, a <laughs> picture of the Polaroid chief chemist Howard G. Rogers and staff members, and they pose with 5,000 bottles of chemical compounds used to discover the Polaroid color film process in 1963. Awesome. So it's, a, it's an amazing photo because that was a lot of trial and error and trying out different compounds and finding the right thing and experimenting. And that, is, that means a lot of different chemistry. So putting those 5,000 bottles on a large table uh, it, and, and then putting the people uh, who did the chemistry there uh, on the photo, it's, it's a, I, I'm just happy to see this. Cause that, <laughs> that looks oddly like one of those really cracked out... Um, Mid-journey <laughs> AI <laughs> kind of images. <laughs> it's it's an unusual picture, but it's really it's it's great. It's it's a it's a it's a work, a work portrait, 
so to speak. So yeah, very, very happy about that. Okay. Really, really here's, fun. here's my pick. Um, and, and it's, it's a, a pick that I really, hold on. I think I screwed this up. Hold on. This is your Mastodon. Yes. Uh, and I just joined Macedon. I started to post. Oh, I've seen you post lots of pictures already. Yeah, uh, these are these are my n noodling and doodling. Um, you know, lots of uh, AI work. <laughs> mostly AI work. This one I like. <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> I know. I don't uh, know what a baduk dart is, but oh, it's the best place for ice cream. Uh, okay, all in right. Pennsylvania I see. in 1955. I see. So. <laughs> Um, I don't know quite how to, there's a picture, I, my only yeah. real picture. I, I, I'm not quite sure how it worked. Now, this is a good picture. You see this? Uh, double click on that. It, one observes this very carefully. What do you see? Well, I see a slightly artificial looking woman sitting at a table. Mm -hmm. Um... It's a kitchen in the 60s, 50s, 60s, maybe. Yeah. With quite typical colors. She's slightly boxy shaped with a big behind on the, on the chair. <laughs> do, you, do you notice she has three arms? <laughs> oh, there's another arm. This looks like one of those Photoshop disasters, but it's <laughs> mid journey exactly, screwing yes. up here. Yeah, hands, hands and number of limbs. That's one of the things that um, these tools don't do well all the time. Yes. So I, I, I quite like Mastodon's ease of use, and, and, but I have no idea how to amplify its social connections. Well, like, no it's, idea. It's, it's culturally different from, from Twitter. It, it is. And that's one of the reasons people flock to it. Um, yeah. But uh, what, what I find is that uh, the conversations I have there are much more meaningful if I start engaging with people. And, uh, and that then, in turn, grows the network. But it, it, is, it, is a, it is a different culture. You have to get used to it in some way. Yeah, I just thought I would keep posting and, and figure it out as I go along. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would say <clears throat> if you want to post pictures, you could try PixelFed. PixelFed is a Mastodon affiliated thing that uh, is trying to be a bit more like Instagram. So get their get their client, get an account there, and then you can cross post between your oh. Mastodon instance and the PixelFed instance, and so on. So that's um, that's one way to to have a bit more of an Instagram like uh, thing yeah. going. I find it's a lot calmer place than any other of the social media. Just and a lot it's, less shouting, for sure. That's what I mean. It's, <laughs> yeah. All right. It's good. Well, so thanks for showing us the Antarctic and yes. for More to talking come. about your adventures. I'm, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to get you on Curiously Polar because that's where. I talk about these things with uh, an expedition, with two expedition leaders, one being an ice specialist and the right. other being a, uh, a marine uh, biologist. So it, it would be great to dig deeper, no pun intended. We'll we'll go to. Uh, if, and by the way, if anyone's interested, curiouslyporter.com is where you find that part of my podcasting uh, thing. Anyway, that's it for this week thanks everyone for being here and you can of course find more at curiously uh, at <laughs> thefuturephotography.com <laughs> see you then take care bye bye, bye, -bye. you've been listening to the future of photography subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Mm -hmm.